Well, good morning, everyone. And well, maybe I shouldn't say that because it might not be morning for you. It is morning for me. I have uh, about a gallon of coffee right here next to this computer, which may or may not be a dangerous thing. Um, I'm a wannabe morning person. Maybe you're like me and you're actually listening to this at 1130 at night. So whatever time it is, welcome to exercise three. Um, this is Mrs. Wade, by the way, and I'm so happy to go over this material with you. And so um, right now we're going to look at cell transport and permeability. And that's one of those titles that may or may not make a lot of sense. It may sound really boring, actually, and I don't blame you for that. You kind of look at this and you're like, hey, I'm in an anatomy class. Why am I having to go over cell transport and permeability? And let me just tell you that this is a very, very important chapter because it really sets you up not only for lecture concepts, um, but it really, especially if you're going into healthcare, these concepts are going to help you understand medicine a whole lot better. So um, what I'll focus on mostly in this chapter are going over these objectives and defining the terms. In today's lab, we are actually going to have um, several experiments set up for you, and they're really fun, cool experiments. And I think they're great because this chapter tends to be very wordy and conceptual. And you might be the type of person that struggles with just reading a bunch of conceptual text. That's how I was, and still am, actually. And so I do great when I have visual representations of what I'm studying. And so that's what this week's lab will um, be composed of. But before lab, it is super important that you understand the terminology that we have within objective one. So that's what this video will focus on. I'll go through these terms, um, not in this order. Um, I like to teach these terms in an order um, that I think makes a little bit more sense as in the definitions build on one another. And the better you know these terms going into this week's lab, the more prepared you'll be for the experiments and the easier time you'll have understanding all the concepts we have. So let's go ahead and dive in. Okay, let's start with this first term, selectively permeable. Now don't write what I have on the screen just yet because those aren't actually the definitions. Those are just things that will help you understand uh, selectively permeable and what that means. And so just remember that this is going to refer to the plasma membrane specifically. Remember the plasma membrane is that uh, structure that is made up of the phospholipid bilayer and it's going to help keep things inside the cell and things outside of the cell. It's kind of the border between the stuff on the inside versus the stuff on the outside. And so when we think of these two words here, selectively permeable, in regards to the plasma membrane, we'll say, okay, well selectively must mean that that membrane is picky or choosy. Um, it isn't just a free-for-all. And then that word permeable, that just means pass. I kind of think permeable, pass. So if something is permeable, it means it can pass, and you can see those examples I have there. If it is non-permeable, it means it cannot pass. So just remember when we're looking at selectively permeable membranes, this is a really good thing because uh, we don't just want any kind of solute particle going into the cell or out of the cell. We need to have balance. And that's what all these terms that we'll look at and, and the other terms you'll look at in lecture refer to. Basically how the cell regulates what is on the outside versus what's on the inside, and then how cells even communicate to one another. Okay, now let's look at what a concentration gradient is. And I like to use color gradients as an example. So here we have this tube. Let's just pretend we put a drop of black dye into this tube of water. When the color first goes in, it will be very concentrated, meaning that those black molecules will be very crowded together. 
as we go down this tube, you'll notice that it looks lighter down here. And why is it lighter? It's because we have less black molecules of color. So when we say we have a concentration gradient, we're really referring to solute particles. So what does this word solute mean? Well, remember that uh, we have some S words here. We have solute, solvent, and solution. So I like to use sugar water as an example. The solute tends to be the thing that becomes dissolved in a solution or kind of the solid uh, part of the solution. So in that example, the solute would be the sugar molecules. The solvent tends to be the liquidy portion. So in sugar water, that would be the water. And then the solution is simply the solute plus solvent. So then the solution is called sugar water. Okay, so I'd like to kind of simplify that so that when you see these words, um, it makes a little bit more sense. So when we say we have a concentration gradient, we're saying that this area is more concentrated because the solute particles are crowded. As we go down the concentration gradient, we have less solute particles. And in nature, things tend to move from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. And if you guys remember that concept, that is really going to help you understand um, several other concepts we'll look at in lab and lecture. Let's now take a quick look at the differences between active and passive transport. And we want you to know specifically that active transport processes require energy. And we will mostly see that in the form of ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And then passive processes do not require energy, meaning this is kind of how things naturally flow. Now, the big picture I want for y'all to understand is that sometimes in the body when we require energy, it's because we are forcing a molecule um, or some type of smaller substance like an ion against its concentration gradient. Passive processes, therefore, just kind of go with the flow. So if we think about floating down a river, when, when you do this with your friends, you go to the top of the river and you sit in your tube and you just kind of sit in it. And that's the whole point of um, floating down the river is that you're just kind of hanging out. Now, if you have to turn around and swim upstream for any kind of reason, you're going to be using a lot of energy. And the reason why you're using a lot of energy is because you are going against the current or against the flow. And that's the same uh, kind of the same illustration we use for active transport. Whereas passive transport, that's just you simply floating down the river, you're going along the concentration gradient. With the experiments we'll be looking at in lab this week, we are focusing on the passive transport processes, specifically diffusion and osmosis. So we'll look at how solute particles will travel down their concentration gradients and the things that kind of affect the speed of that diffusion. And then uh, we'll also focus on how water moves and the things that affect the direction of that water flow. Here we have a visual example of diffusion. And recall that from our last slide that diffusion is one of the, uh, excuse me, passive transport processes. So here I've got two beakers. If we have a group of molecules here or solute particles, they're naturally going to move about and diffusion is going to describe the movement of solute particles down their concentration gradient. Now, when I describe the concentration gradient, remember I had kind of color as an example where we dropped in a, a drop of color into a tube, but it just describes any time we go from an area of high concentration, meaning they're clumped together, to an area of low concentration, as you can see on the right side.
Okay, let's take a look at diffusion rate. And remember that rate is going to describe distance over time. And so this is a value we use to tell us how quickly or how slowly something is traveling. And we will apply that to basically how quickly or how slowly molecules diffuse or move down their concentration gradient. So let's first look at molecular weight. When we uh, focus on molecular weight, we find that lighter molecules diffuse faster than heavier molecules. And the example I'd like to use um, looks at two male Olympic athletes. Here we have Michael Johnson, who is a sprinter, and Joe Kovacs, who is an Olympic male shot putter. Now, just looking at their body habitus, who is going to be lighter? Yeah, obviously Michael Johnson. And, and sprinters tend to be taller, leaner athletes. Field event athletes, especially in the shot put, tend to be heavier, bulkier. Um, and that's just simply due to the type of training they have to do uh, for their particular sport. So if we were to line up Mr. Johnson and Mr. Kovacs on a straightaway of the track and then tell them to race, who do you think would win? Yeah, obviously Mr. Johnson here. And so we might say, well, of course, it's because he's a, he's a male Olympic sprinter. But if we're just kind of simplifying the concept to relate it to what we're looking at here in diffusion rate, we would say Mr. Johnson weighs a lot less than Mr. Kovacs. And so that is why he would win the race. He would travel faster. And molecules behave the same way. And so when we use arrows to look at this concept, we would see that this is an indirect or inverse relationship, that the lower the weight or the lighter the molecule, the faster the rate, the quicker it travels. Now let's look at surface area to volume ratios. Now this is a concept that is going to be much clearer when we get into class and you see the experiments. So for now, I just want you guys to memorize this trend and then really apply it once you see the experiments face to face. Remember that a ratio is going to be a value that compares two things. And so we are basically comparing the volume to the surface area of the same object. And what we find is that the higher the ratio number, the faster diffusion occurs in that sized object. So again, once we get to lab, this makes a whole lot more sense, but the surface area to volume ratio has a direct relationship, meaning the arrows go in the same direction. The higher that ratio number is, the faster diffusion occurs. And then finally, let's talk about temperature. We find that heat will increase diffusion rate. And so if we were to take the opposite of that, cold temperatures, because remember, all coldnesses is the absence of heat. We see that cold temperatures will therefore decrease diffusion rate. All right, now let's look at osmosis and the key thing I want you to think about when you see this word osmosis is water. So I've been talking about solute particles, meaning we've looked at these molecules and we've paid attention to how they travel. But when we look at osmosis, we're really focusing on how the liquid portion or really how water travels across the semi-permeable membrane. So here you can see, tell me, or really you know, answer by yourselves, because I can't hear what you're saying. Um, we have these solute particles. Is this more concentrated or less concentrated compared to this side? Yeah, this would be less because there are less solute particles. Here we have more. So we would say this is more concentrated. Well, remember that solute particles and water or any kind of liquid want to find balance. So here, this water is going to want to move to this side, as we see here, so that the water to solute ratio is equal. 
Here we have an excess of water, and we don't have enough water on this side. So water will move across, pretend we have this membrane here that, that kind of creates a barrier between the two. And so this water will move across naturally in order to retain balance on that side. So with osmosis, focus on the movement of water across that semi-permeable membrane. Let's now take a look at cell tonicity. And tonicity is this fancy way of referring to the um, tension that water creates uh, on the cell membrane here, okay? Because we're gonna have liquid everywhere. And so there is a tension force that is going to be exerted on that cell membrane. And it's important that we have balance. You're gonna hear that word a lot, balance, balance, balance. That's you know, uh, what we looked at in the uh, organ systems and homeostasis lab, that's, that's what homeostasis is. It's just finding balance in the body. So here, I want you to focus on these prefixes here. And these prefixes are going to be the things that really give you a clue as to what the cell itself looks like. So here we have um, erythrocytes, red blood cells, um, just kind of my little insert here. It's kind of funny because technically they're not cells by definition, but you know, maybe that's, uh, I'll talk more about that in an Instagram post or something like that. Um, but we just call them red blood cells and that's okay. So here we're going to look at, I want you to focus on water and how water is moving either in or out of the cell. So this term ISO, let's start here. ISO means same. Hopefully that's what you were saying before I gave the answer. And so here you can see that if water goes in the cell, water will also leave um, the same rate or the same amount of water molecules, however you want to think of it. If two water molecules go in, two water molecules will leave. And we have balance here. So isotonic is kind of a balanced state. Now let's look at, uh, let's go over here to a hypertonic solution. A hypertonic solution means that water is leaving the cell. Um, so what does this mean? Hyper means elevated, and hopefully you were able to come to that word. So elevated what? Well, think back to our uh, example right here. Okay, what is water going to do? It's going to try to balance solute particles, right? And there's this saying, water follows salt is what I learned way back in chemistry. But we can kind of modify that to say water follows solute particles. I like to say water has a mad case of FOMO, fear of missing out. So if solute particles are going to travel somewhere, water says, hey, wait for me, and it will follow it. Okay, so let's go back to this example here. If we know that water is leaving the cell, what does that tell you about this environment outside of the cell? Will there be more or less solute particles out here? Yeah, hopefully you're saying more because that's the main reason why water would come out of the cell. It's because there are more solute particles out here and we're essentially taking water from inside the cell to try to balance this environment out here. So hyper, refers to the fact that there are more solute particles on the outside of the cell. When water leaves the cell like this, it causes them to shrink, and that is what crenation is. Or if a cell crenates, it means it is shrinking. Okay, now let's look at a hypotonic solution. So if you're just kind of looking at these, you can see, hey, these, these cells are really big and bloated, so I think hypo, we are bloated, okay? That cell is swollen. So again, what does hypo mean? It means decreased or lower, so lower what? Well, if we saw over here on the hypertonic side that we had 
more out here, then hypo must mean we have what? Less. So that means if there are less out here, there are more in here. And so water is going to go into the cell. Another way that you can think about this is that remember molecules like their space. And so if there is too much water out here, then water is going to go into spaces to try to get rid of all the excess out here. And so that's why these cells will bloat. Now we have to be careful because there's only so much that these cells can take. And if um, too much water goes into them, they can actually lice or uh, rupture, and that is not good. So an example, um, kind of clinical examples I like to share when we talk about this is, um, you know, if we are in a dehydrated state, okay, this, this might represent a, a specific stage of dehydration. If we are overhydrated, meaning we drink way too much water, Okay. So, and I'm talking about just straight water. This is why um, um, these sports drinks were invented, these things that have electrolytes in it, because you're not just replenishing water. If you go outside and you work out and you're really thirsty, you know, I'm not saying don't drink water, but maybe, especially if you're sweating a lot, remember you're sweating out electrolytes, drink something that has solute particles in it so that we maintain this isotonic uh, environment here. All right, that's all I have for you guys for this br uh, pre-lab brief video. Um, so as long as you just drill, drill, drill these definitions, you will be well prepared to understand the experiments we have set up for you in lab this week. Hope you have a great rest of the day.